Thank you. Good? Okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here in our, our second Evenings with Audubon uh, speaker series event this season. Uh, my name is Matt Reitz. I'm the Executive Director of Madison Audubon Society. I, it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. I also see lots of new faces. I'm very excited about that, too. I would definitely invite all of you to uh, check out some of the things that Madison Audubon Society is doing this season. There's a lot of opportunities to get involved in seed collecting, and uh, I think there's still seed collecting going on. Well, maybe not. It's waning down, so hurry up. Yes, Roger says yes. So if you want to collect some seed at a beautiful prairie, it's a great opportunity to do that. And there's lots of other things that are going on this season too. So I really invite you to get involved, come on field trips, um, have a great time celebrating birds and conservation in Wisconsin. Uh, I, get, I have the distinct pleasure of also introducing our speaker for the evening. This gentleman harassed the, uh, the, the committee to uh, over and over again, please allow them to let him speak and uh, present some interesting work. I'm that person. <laughs> so I'm going to be presenting tonight uh, about the, the, the cowbird, one of my favorite species and probably not yours. <laughs> um, so I, as a show of hands, how many people kind of under, know what the cowbird is and what it does? And how many people honestly like the cowbird? <laughs> That's okay. That might not change by the end of this. That's really fine. Uh, but what my goal here is just present some information, some of the, some of the work that I've done, some of the work that some other folks have done, uh, round out a little bit of what the cowbird's all about, uh, what the controversies are surrounding the cowbird, and really some of the amazing things about this species that I find utterly fascinating. This, I think, is missed. Yeah. No? Is that good? All right. This is uh, the t main take home from today. That no matter what, no matter what I say, no matter what you feel about cowbirds, birds are awesome. Birds are incredible. They make life better. They're the heart of our work. I hope you love them as much as I do and, and maybe more. And just a little bit about me, I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of different kinds of field work around the world, uh, the Caribbean, in South America, in Australia, and I got my feet wet, actually, my, literally, my boots wet, while uh, working in the swamps of southern Illinois on planetary warblers and uh, effects of cowbirds and other and predators on planetary warblers. Planetary warblers are a uh, beautiful yellow bird, you'll see one later. Uh, this is Jeff Hoover, who was my... Uh, uh, my boss, uh, now a friend, and uh, we worked on, on a lot of different questions related to cowbirds, and that's the first time I really got a taste of what cowbirds were all about. And then went on to do other work, but also did my dissertation work at the University of Florida studying various questions related to cowbirds and their ecology in the southeastern United States of Florida. I'm not going to get too much into the, de the details of all that stuff. I'm going to paint some broad strokes. I'm going to talk more I want to be more of a storyteller, I think, today than, than a data, re, a data spitter outer. Um, so let's start with the real basics. A lot of you know cowbirds already, but what act exactly, for those of you who don't, this is a really small blackbird. I think it's North America's smallest blackbird. I'm not quite sure. I think it is. But it really likes open fields. It likes edges. It likes pastures. It likes meadows. Uh, it will eventually get forest, but it really likes these open areas. And they really evolved that way. Its scientific name is Malathrus ater, and ater means black, which is, describes the male plumage, although the male plumage is really more iridescent blue. It's gorgeous when you get it in the right light. It's really, really pretty. It looks like a black bird with a brown head when you see it in the wrong light. Otherwise, if you catch it right, wow, it's, it's fabulous. The females, on the other hand, are a little drab. That tends to be true in, in, the, in the bird world. Interestingly enough, the genus Melothrus is a, thought to be a misspelling of the word Melobrus, which is Greek for vagabond or, or uh, thief. Uh, yeah, shrimp, not good stuff. So already, uh, it, even in the Latin name, a little bit of, uh, you know, not cast in the, in the highest light. So this is what's known as our, this is our best known, what's known as a brood parasite. We'll get into that. That's a, a fancy word for uh, its way of going about reproducing. 
There are three of these guys in North America. They're not as common as the brown-headed cowbird. So a brood parasite is a, is a species that makes its living by laying its eggs in other birds' nests. So it does not build its own nest. It, it, like I said, it lays its eggs in a wide variety of nests, sometimes only in specific host species nests, and sometimes in a lot of different kinds. And uh, it doesn't really do any parental care either. They don't feed their young. They don't really defend their young. So um, as a result of that, it's, uh, uh, it's gotten a bad reputation because people view it as yeah, a more, like a moral, moral issue. <laughs> you know, sort of abandoning your kids and not raising them. So the brown-headed cowbird, this is, by the way, the shiny cowbird on the top left and, um, of the birds there, and then that's the bronze cowbird that's in the southeast. The shiny cowbird is really a Caribbean bird that makes its way into Florida sometimes, which I actually caught one, one once. Um, but the brown-headed cowbird is an obligate brood parasite. It's a fancy word for me, meaning that it doesn't have a choice. It doesn't, it can't one day go, well, you know, this whole business I've been working on for a while, I maybe I'll go make a nest tomorrow. It's an obligate, it doesn't do anything else. And it's a generalist because it lays its eggs in a lot of different species nests. It doesn't, it does not discriminate. There are ones that it likes better, but brown-headed cowbirds have been known to lay their eggs in duck nests. That's, that's a, it's a very optimistic cowbird. <laughs> I'm sure a very confused duck. <laughs> so they so they're generalist species. 247 different hosts. It's amazing, quite amazing. So they are not well liked. Uh, this is probably it might not be the most hated bird in North America. That might belong to maybe the starling. I don't know. That's up to you guys. I don't. Know. But it is certainly the most hated native species. And that's, uh, you, you see this all through different forms of media and literature. Here's a, a quote from uh, the, the red-eyed brown cover. <laughs> bronze cover is a handsome bird and that feathered wretch, the brown-headed cover. And the reason I like this is that it's from a bird guide. It's from a bird manual. <laughs> so it's a, they're not pulling any punches on this guy. This is another bird guide. You have to read this passion sometime. <laughs> the passage that Dawson wrote on cowbirds is monumentally, uh, oh, it is no, no service at all to cowbirds. This is tame compared to the rest of it. And we see this in the popular media, and news outlets, uh, not cast in a nice light. Before I came here, I did a quick internet search of comments below cowbird stories. Similar 
to each other. They don't, there's not a lot of change in the covered egg. It's usually white with speckled brown. So they don't make different colors and different sizes and shapes generally. So um, you can put it in a bluebird nest and it looks a lot different than a bluebird egg. So here she is and she's laid her egg and she's getting ready now to turn around and take out the cardinal. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and she's poking the other one too, so she's ensuring that the second one is going to probably fail. So you're already anthropomorphizing what she's doing. You know you are. I know you're thinking bad thoughts about her. It's okay. It's really okay. And then she'll fly off and uh, find another nest to do this in. Yeah. So. So they, they remove a damaged host eggs. They, because there are eggs in the nest, the eggs that are in that net, the covered eggs actually hatch typically faster than the host eggs do. When I say host, I mean that's the species that eggs, they, whatever species they lay the egg, that nest, eggs in their nest. Um, so that the covered egg usually hatches first. That means it gets food right away. Uh -huh. That means it grows faster. That means the other ones don't get food as much. So what we see is reduced hatching success of the host eggs and, the, and reduced fledging success of the young. So here's a, here's a uh, I believe this is a Carolina wren nest, but I'm not sure. Um, but the pink eggs are Carolina wrens, and the, this, is, this is really a dump nest. And I mean, a clutch of Carolina egg nest, the eggs is uh, four to five, maybe three to five. And this is really impossible for a tiny little bird to eat. But it more, more than likely that cowbird eggs will hatch first out of this nest. And here's a cowbird here. You can tell which one's the cowbird. <laughs> which one of these guys is going to get food? <laughs> here's a bluebird feeding a cowbird. And the, the, the yellow gate, this is the bluebird, there. That chicks. So they are uh, very good at uh, growing quick. They grow quickly, too. The fledglings, the nestlings grow very quickly. And they fledge quicker than the native species do. Here's a wood thrush. It has, if you look closely, her chicks are right up front, and this, uh, this guy on the side has apparently had, not had enough to eat yet. <laughs> so, harassing the mom, so please give me some more food. So, it reduces the hatching and nesting success of the, of the nest. Here's a yellow warbler. This is always a dramatic one because typically what happens here is one cowbird will survive and nothing else will survive in this fat. See, I'm doing it again. Uh, this big cowbird will build this nest, and a yellow warbler probably thinks, oh, I'm doing so well. <laughs> big my chick is, it is huge. <laughs> Kudos to me. <laughs> also, they, uh, the, there's some costs associated with the fact that, they, that they're growing big babies. So, uh, uh, increased first year and male mortality. What this means is that a, a, a host that, that, let's say a bluebird fledges or a, a prothonotary warbler fledges out of the nest, they have lower survival overall from year to year. Because typically what's happening is the cowbird is also still getting food. And they've also had maybe reduced fledging weight. It came out of the nest lighter and get enough food. Um, and then males are, um, males and this is probably true of females too, but the reason for that their mortality is typically higher is that they're working really hard. The cowbirds are banging after bird, they're in the nest. You can pay, if you pay attention in the summer, you can hear banging cowbirds everywhere. Uh, they, they're following this, this dark, this, this is a, a junco male that this guy's following around, Wilson's warbler. This happens all through the bird world. Song sparrow, this is a white crown sparrow, cardinal. Um, so, lots and lots of feeding is going on outside the nest too, at, potentially at the expense of the other young and they, at the expense of these guys, are, these adults are working really hard. So because of this, uh, certain populations have been, threatened by, to, uh, uh, have been threatened by extinction because of cowbird parasitism. So species like Bell's vireo and the black cap vireo in Texas, and our own Kirtland's warbler, which is now in Wisconsin. Michigan. So as a result of that, there are very large scale cowbird trapping programs that uh, are run by, served by the federal government or state governments or our local agencies where they trap cowbirds and they euthanize them to reduce the effects of, of cowbirds parasitizing nests. 
So they reduced parasitism on Kirkland's warblers, for example, and that has helped their populations rebound to some extent. We'll come back to this. But cowbird trapping is a widespread, I don't even call it widespread, it is a well-used technique in North America to control cowbirds as a way of, of at least at some level increasing reproduction of target species like Kirkland's warbler. So let's go through a few things that some people have, these are thoughts that I've heard through the literature or through the media or people have said to me. And I kind of wanted to go through each one of these in turn um, and, say, and see what the, what the natural history or the, the data shows. So cowards, they're taking over. This is a partial truth, I would say. They were historically associated with bison herds that roamed the Great Plains. And as they did so, um, they, they, were really, they were called buffalo birds at that time. Um, even though buffalo are really not really a North American species, not a North American animal, bison are. So they would follow these bison herds around, and the bison would stir up arthropods, insects, bugs, and then they would also give them access to seeds that fell out of the shortgrass prairie. So they were really confined to the shortgrass uh, plains. And as they moved around with the herds of the buffalo, they would lay their eggs in the nests of the species that were around them. And uh, so one year, for example, one or two years, maybe the yellow warblers in that area would really get hit hard, and then the cowards would move on with the bison herds. Guess what we did with bison herds? <laughs> we also helped them to expand to new areas, too. So we got rid of their bison herds. Um, we created really easy ways for them to accept, access more different kinds of habitat. So we cut stuff down. We converted, converted prairies to agriculture. We cut through forests. We uh, created permanent feeding areas, which is a really big deal uh, in the form of basically like livestock ag agriculture. Um, so if you, if you grew up in a farm in Wisconsin, of course you've seen cowbirds at the feet of your, of your livestock. Um, so as the, as, we, as the cowbird got opportunity, it moved around, and it came into contact with new hosts, and it, get, it got to stay where it was, and parasitized over and over again those, those host species. So it probably had a limited set of species that it parasitized at first, and then now it, can, uh, can, it came into contact with more. So it generally spread around, started in the 1800s, really moved, it moved south very slowly, but moved quickly eastern and, and quickly West, south, uh, southwest. So, uh, cowbirds were in you know New England in the 1830s, I want to say, um, and so they generally expanded over the last 100, 100, 150 years. Reached Florida in the 1950s or so, and people freaked out. First one was seen in 1957, and they thought it was the end of all the unique warbler species in Florida. Um, so now they're they're pretty much set up everywhere. So they're, the, yes, they have expanded. Um, but, interestingly enough, since we started counting them in the 1960s, a rigorous count, the Reading Bird Survey and the Bird Count, populations are decreasing now, where a lot of things are being converted back into the forest. Um, there are control measures now as well, but there is a population decline in cowbirds as we more or less restore habitat. So, cowbirds did kind of take over, but they're not continuing to. I don't think that makes you feel better, but, you know. All right, some people have said, well, they're not really from here, or they're new to here. Well, the data doesn't suggest that. The fossil data doesn't suggest that. They have been here in North America, throughout North America, for 500,000 years or so, like half a million years. So there's fossil data from California and Florida and all through the Midwest that, that shows that this species was around in the Pleistocene. That's way before even the charismatic megafauna of the Pleistocene was here and went extinct, like the giant sloths and the squirrels and all the crazy black giant armadillos and saber-toothed tigers and big bears and all sorts of crazy stuff. So these guys have been here for a long, long, long time doing what they do. So what about birds being defenseless against them? I've heard this as well. Um, 
So to some extent, yeah, some of them are, some of them aren't. Some species are really good at, say, at, at, like an American robin, for example, will see a covered egg in its nest. Brown thrasher is a good example of this. They'll see it in there and go, I can't even believe you tried that. It's terrible. Like, <laughs> that's out of there. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It doesn't look, even, it even looks like a brown thrasher egg. The shape's slightly different, but the thrasher knows it's not its egg, so it's gone. Robins are easier than blue, so that's, that's easy enough to tell apart. Uh, warbling vireos are even good at their, their puncture ejectors. They can get their, they can poke a hole and get it out of there. Not all species can do that. Um, there's something, they, they think there's an evolutionary lag in some species where it might take some time for them to develop these behaviors over time. Except for the fact that cowboys have been here since the Pleistocene. So, you know, I, I'm not sure that that jives very well. A lot of birds will abandon their nests, or uh, like a yellow warbler will abandon its nest, a cardinal will do that, red and black birds do that. A lot, of, a lot of birds will abandon their nest because they know something's not right. They don't want this egg in their nest. They don't have the ability to remove it. They don't have a beak that's big enough, but they can't get it out. Um, some species, like chickadees, will just build a nest right on top of their old nest. You've probably, a lot of you have probably seen this. Said, I think it's adorable. Uh, I'm like, oh. An extra egg in here. All right. <laughs> so, um, and that's not prevalent in all species either, abandoning. And some species accept the eggs. There's a question as to whether that is A, they have no idea and they're just fooled, or B, it's making the best of a bad situation. It's probably both. Some species are probably making the best of a bad situation. I'll show you a reason for that later. Uh, because it does cost to start over again, and there are other costs associated with ejecting eggs from a nest, if you can do that, because cowbirds are awesome. So acceptance actually might be a strategy. I'm sure there, there are definitely species that don't have any idea what's going on, and they probably are thinking, I am doing so awesome because I've raised these giant chicks. So does parasitism always limit host birds? The conventional wisdom is yes, of course it does. Well, I, that is true in some cases. It is particularly true for species that have already suffered declines because of some other reason. Kirtland's warbler, for example, is a habitat specialist. It needs regenerating jack pine that have been regenerated by fire. They need really low stuff. <clears throat> What do, we need lots of fire for that. We, we're really good at not having fire anymore. The whole of Wisconsin's landscape has changed. Michigan's landscape has changed because we've been very good at suppressing fire. I'm not telling us to go out with a six-pack and a lighter. But, but the landscape is different now. And habitat has changed, particularly for Kirkland's warbler. So their range is restricted quite a lot. And so they have small populations. So, so another factor that comes in, like parasitism, is going to have a huge impact on that small population. Same thing's true with the black cap vireo in Texas. They had reduced populations due to habitat. So this happens a lot with, with species that are already hit hard. Parasitism can be a real threat. Other species that are doing well, this can create, it can create some problems, but uh, it's typically kind of washed out. The, uh, there's, so it could hurt one individual bird's reproductive success, like a cardinal. But overall, it's not going to have that much of an impact, particularly when you think about all the other things a cardinal has to deal with. For example, predation. This is probably a much bigger factor in whether or not you survive, you survive or your kids survive, than cowbirds. Predation is probably a much bigger factor. So, for example, only like 3% is an estimate of, of cowbird eggs ever make it anywhere, and that's just cowbird eggs. So, think about, you know, a, a red wing blackbird that's trying to make it, raise a family, it's got to deal with a whole suite of potential predators from the beginning all the way to the end. So, there are other things to think about here, not just parasitism. Uh, parasitism rates tend to be really high, uh, well, I mean, by parasitism rates, I mean the number of nests that you find that have a cowbird egg or a cowbird chicken, the percentage. 
those rates are really high in places where the habitat's been disturbed, where we've done a real good job of creating lots of forest edges and the habitat's disturbed, or we have lots of extra feeding areas. So, um, parasitism itself isn't really what would be limiting here, it would be habitat. So trapping can be done. I, would, I think trapping should continue for Kirtland's warbler. Um, I think it should continue in a lot of, for a lot of different species because it is a really great way, a really great short-term term solution for increasing reproduction. If we are addressing the bigger issues, which is habitat, or whatever else it is, whatever, it's typically habitat. So otherwise we're going to have to catch cowbirds until the cowbirds come home. <laughs> so it'll just be forever. All right, this is my favorite one. No, this is my favorite book. That my mom goes to dry sales, and she always buys me a bird book that she finds. This is one of my favorites from 1947. It's my little show and tell. It's called What Bird Is It? And uh, this is from this is the Calvert entry. I'll read it to you because it's difficult to read up there. <laughs> Well, I could probably just read it on the screen too. Well, it is, I probably know by heart though, too. <laughs> Alright, it is, uh, this mean lazy bird lays her egg in some other bird's nest and let the other bird hatch it and feed her big hungry crybaby. <laughs> and then this, this cute little girl from the 1940s is saying, what bird is a poor mother? <laughs> so, so, uh, not uh, cast in the best light. Lazy, mean, poor mother. All right, I have huge respect for cowbird moms for a variety of reasons. Cowbird females are awesome at finding nests. They are specialists at it. Uh, I know a lot of people who have dedicated a lot of field time to being nest searchers. They are nothing on a female cowbird. Because she, what she'll do is set up on the edge of, edge of something and just, just watch. Kind of check everything out, see, see what's going on. See if she sees a female cover with, or a female host species with a twig in her mouth. Or delivering food. Or <coughs> chirping at her in a way that's territorial. Some female cowbirds have been seen crashing around in the bushes to try, they, to, they think, to flush a nesting bird so she can find the nest. So she's looking all the time, looking for nests very carefully, very craftily. She's watching, searching habitat, watching for adults. Then females will go out, females choose the mates, as they should. <laughs> Male cowbirds are working really hard to impress the females. The females are just kind of walking. They're going about their foraging business, and the males are working hard to impress them. And then once in a while, the female finds a nest. She chooses a male who's up to snuff. She will time copulation, time reproduction, so she can produce an egg at the right time. So she's just, she can be ready to, to lay the egg when she needs to. And she's doing this for all the nests she can find in her area her home range. And they have big home ranges. They'll travel long distances. They'll travel almost seven kilometers in between feeding sites and breeding sites. So they're moving. They're going far distances. So they're, they're not limited by, by much. And it puts them into contact with a lot of different potential nests. They also, my favorite part of this is that they're not done. They're not really dropping the kids off. They're dropping the kids off at daycare but sticking around and making sure daycare is doing a good job. So they're actually watching the nest. So first of all, uh, one really interesting thing I forgot to mention is that the female will find a nest, but she's not going to go in there right away. She's not going to just charge in, knock the female off the nest, lay her egg and get out of there. That's too suspicious. So she'll wait till the next day or two days later, wait outside her nest for the female to leave in the morning to forage, and then sneak in. We, I had the pleasure of watching this one time. We saw a female cow, we saw a brand new nest, we knew there was a female cow around, and we were like, oh, I know this is gonna happen. As soon as this Carolina wren pops off the nest, this female's gonna come in. So we sat there and got destroyed by mosquitoes, and uh, sure enough, she popped in there and laid her egg. So 
So she is working. She is not lazy. Not to mention the fact that she can, she's like a chicken. I mean, unbelievable egg production abilities. Unbelievable. Off the charts. So in the course of this, uh, one season, 40 eggs. That is incredible. And the record is 77. This is for a, a female, a captive female, I believe, that was in captivity. So that's in one season producing 40 eggs. That's basically no time to rest. And in fact, their ovaries, where they're producing these eggs, they don't regress. So a typical bird will produce her clutch and then her ovaries will shrink down. And then wait until she needs them again. Cowbirds don't do that. They're pumping eggs out. I did a study where I looked at cowbirds, uh, I had to look at their ovaries, which I had to kill them. Um, and it was incredible to watch. You could estimate the laying rate, you could estimate the number of eggs that they produced uh, using basically what here's, here's this is gonna, these are pre ovulatory follicles, these are going to become ovum, yolks, and uh, become eggs. And then those deflated ones are ones that have already been, have already been uh, released in the ovary. Sometimes we find two eggs inside the same ovary. So one right at the end, one right at the beginning. So she's just cranking these things up like crazy. So they can start a new clutch in as little as one day. They can lay a bunch of eggs, maybe they're done. No, not really. It's starting over again one day. So, incredible. And they also are very fast egg layers, too. So, a lot of species take the time. I guess they want to do it right, but she doesn't have the luxury of that. So she can lay an egg ten times faster than any other ichthyrid, which is a blackbird. Any other blackbird. So, faster than most other birds. Really, 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 really fast. So, this, this gal is, in my mind, like an uber mom. Like there is, she might do it differently, but she is dedicated. She is working. It's long been thought that based on their way of life, that they're lazy and they tend to be, they must be dumb because they're just dropping their, their kids off and they're not doing anything about it. And all they do is eat and lay eggs. That they're thought to be not so smart. Ah, but I beg to differ. Well, first of all, this is maybe not related to weather intelligence, but the male behaviors are really fascinating. If you ever get a chance to watch males interacting with each other and interacting with females, it's a blast. Because the males are doing this, so the males are typically hanging out by themselves and kind of waiting around for females to do something. Um, you know, so I imagine it's like a bunch of guys at the corner and they're like, you know, talking, they're talking about cars or something like that. Um, but they're posturing to each other. They're setting up hierarchies. So the dominant, they do all these great displays. Like this is a head-up display, a billpoint display. Um, and here's here's two males who are doing a, a billpoint display, and then another male is doing a head-down display, which is also used with females. But the, this this up thing is, is a way to establish dominance. So the most dominant males are the ones who kind of win these these uh, these displays. That, that also, that face down one is also a sign of, uh, of uh, agonistic behavior. It's aggression. It's, a, it's, not, it's aggression, more or less, without being too human about it. Um, and then they also do that. To, so the males are working hard. The female comes around, she makes her little chatter call, which you, if you ever hear, recognize it. The female will come in to feed and, and uh, 